Uh, let me first say a few words about the context of uh, this work. Uh, it's a project that I started some time ago called SIGL. And the purpose is to create high quality modules for implementers of commonwealth systems. And I'm hoping to improve existing techniques in, with respect to algorithms and data structures uh, if I find that way of doing things. And uh, I intend to improve readability, maintainability of the code, documentation as well, and ultimately take all these modules and create an implementation of it. But that's going to take a little bit of time. But for several years in a row now, I have systematically been able to improve at least one aspect of it. So for the particular case of the sequence functions of columns, there are some challenges. Um, if you want good performance, then you need to specialize. You need to have several special versions of a function according to things like the element type of the vector, if the sequence happens to be a vector, or uh, whether the end uh, keyword parameter was given or not. It's not given. You don't have to test for any index if you you uh, traverse a list of reasons. So there are several specializations that you have to take into account. <clears throat> but um, one way of doing that is, of course, to create a separate implementation for each kind of specialization. And that was my first attempt in SQL a couple of years back. And I ended up with thousands of versions of it. And you can then imagine trying to write tests for those so that you have 100% coverage. It was just not possible. It was just not maintainable. Very fast, but not maintainable. So the other way of doing it is you actually don't write the function itself. You write macros or one macro that creates all of these functions. And that works a little bit better. You, can, uh, you don't have to test all possible combinations now. You just have to make sure that the all the lines in the macro are covered. But when you look at this macro in the end, you don't actually understand what it's doing. So it's not, in my opinion, maintainable. So this is the challenge to get both of those to work. Um, one thing I'm not going to talk about today is how we handle the parameter of from end when it's T on lists. Uh, we did that. Uh, in uh, London in 2015. And that's part of this work, but I'm, not, I'm going to exclude that very part because we already talked about it. So if you look at how existing implementations, uh, um, the, the code for the sequence functions of existing implementations, uh, you have all the versions that I just told you about. CCL has several versions of each function, perhaps not one for each kind of specialization, but different uh, versions, like my first attempt. Um, SPCL uses a mixed approach, sometimes has uh, different versions, sometimes the macro approach where the macro generates functions that are specialized. Um, ECL is a very interesting case. Uh, it, the code in ACL is very similar to what we ended up with, but it doesn't use the technique that we do, so their macros don't look the same as ours. Uh, and I look at CLISP as well, and the C sequence functions are implemented in C, so we're not going to uh, talk about that today because it's not um, interesting for this particular talk. So our technique uses um, macros for each required specialization, but not to create specialized functions. These macros will duplicate their body in interesting ways that will help the compiler optimize. So what I'm going to do is show you basically one simplified example that shows the technique as it is, and then you have to just imagine all the other possible specializations that we accomplish. So let's say uh, we want to specialize on this 
uh, n keyword parameter for a list. So we assume that the sequence we're going to handle is a list. We assume that it's the find function. And I'm actually also going to assume that um, the T function is identity and the test function is EQL. But we specialize for all those things as well. But this particular example shows only the technique for specializing on the N parameter. So the last parameter there, N, is either a true or false, depending on whether somebody said colon N T or colon N. Yeah. So the, the simplified find, find function, if you don't do any particular specialization, will look like this. It will have a loop, and then inside the loop it will say something like, well, if both, it's both the case that the end parameter is true and the index is greater than or equal to that end parameter, then uh, we stop. Otherwise, we compare the element, and if it's uh, EQL, we return it. It's a very reasonable definition of this particular special case of the find function. <coughs> now, observe here that the value of the parameter n is a loop invariant. It doesn't change in different iterations of the loop, but we don't know what it is. So. Uh, even a very reasonable compiler cannot do very much uh, about this code other than in each iteration check for the value of the end parameter. And in, in addition, because the end might be true, the compiler also has to generate code for incrementing the index vector. If we want better performance, we would like to do something like this. So what I've done here is I've duplicated the loop. And in the second version of it, where n is known to be false, I have removed all the code that depends on that fact. That is, the and, and, and so forth is going to be false. Therefore, the index variable is not going to be used, so I can remove that too. This is a good performance uh, versions of, version of it. Right now we have just introduced this maintenance problem because now we have to write tests that cover both these versions. And like I said, basically the first version of, of the signal sequence functions, there were a couple of thousand cases. So it was kind of impossible to, to test everything. So the way we do it is we say we wrap the loop in a macro. It's called with n. And then of course we have macros with key, with test, and so forth. The loop looks the same. Only one version of the loop this time. The macro looks like this. Completely silly. It basically tests the end variable and then inserts the loop twice. So let's macro expand that. And you get this. Right? But now, the not only is the end loop invariant, the compiler knows which value it has in each one of these loops. So a reasonably good compiler, in particular the SPCL compiler is reasonably good for this case, will take this code and simplify it to that, which is almost identical to the fast version that I showed. So that's how we do it. And in addition to the end, we specialize the key parameter, if it's identity or if it's car, which are common cases, duplicates the code. But the compiler will recognize in each version of the duplicated loop what is the value of the key parameter. It could be not known, not neither identity nor car, in which case you just 
fun calls the the not the identity the the key the key parameter it just fun calls the function in the worst case <coughs> for the test parameter we we check for eq eql so that a good compiler can inline those functions in some common cases. And again, in the worst case, we just fun call the function if it's neither of our special cases. And for vectors, we specialize on the element type. There's no need to specialize for the end parameter for uh, vectors. Uh, it just doesn't add any complication. But um, a particular implementation might have many, many different specialized vectors and uh, specializing on the, on the element type uh, is a big win. So the advantages to this technique is we don't have a problem on duplicated code. So we can have better, uh, um, the tests are easier to accomplish. We can have coverage for a smaller uh, number of tests. So therefore the code is easier to understand and easier to maintain. The resulting code is fast as, just as fast as if we had written out all the specialized versions ourselves. The code is independent of the implementation at least almost. I mean, if you look at that code that I showed you before, it says with n, yes, every implementation that needs to do something with it. Um, some implementations might do absolutely nothing, and that would be correct. Some other implementations might choose to have an implementation like ours of the macro within. Some implementations might have three or four vector element types. Some might have 15, and so forth. But the main code of the sequence functions will look the same. So I claim it's implementation independent as well. <coughs> there are some disadvantages as well. Um, the resulting code, that is the, the result after compilation, uh, is uh, very large, and it, in particular before the compiler has been able to eliminate all the branches that can not be taken. Because every copy of the loop now will have some part, or the majority of the code in the loop will not be reachable in any particular copy of the loop. Only one vector type applies. Only one value of the end parameter applies. Only one value of the key parameter applies. So we, we can easily get more than a thousand different copies of the loop inside. So you can imagine the number of interesting compiler messages you get from the same SPCL compiler note deleting unreachable code. And so that's a disadvantage because you can now not easily detect if you have problems in your code. You have to look very carefully at the, at the messages. And there, in fact, there's also some warnings. Um, in some cases, we have a function that will te uh, test for the key parameter, and if it's car, it will take the car, and if it's uh, identity, it will do the identity and so forth. But the uh, type inference of the SPCL compiler will complain because inside there, there's some code that applies in other cases, but not in this case, and there's a conflicting type between the inferred type and uh, the way it's used. So it's also a ton of warning, and this created problems for us because late, later versions of ASTF convert warnings to failures. So we had to convince ASTF not to abort the compilation. So a lot of compiler messages, but, <clears throat> but we're kind of satisfied with the results. Uh, we tested only on SPCL. Uh, there might be other compilers out there that are equally smart or sufficiently smart for 
for this to work, but we haven't tested that yet. Um, the tests we had do not have any complicated test or key functions, and that's deliberate. If you have complicated test or key functions, the execution time of those functions will dominate the, the timing of the entire thing. So we choose the simplest one as possible, like EQ, and then that is when we test as much as possible of our technique. So there's no point in having complicated key functions. <clears throat> so general interpretation of the result. Um, at best, our technique improves on what SBCL does by a factor of three. Uh, this happens for unspecialized vectors using identity as a key function and using EQ as the test. We get nearly as big an, an improvement uh, for lists, again with identity and EQ. And we obtain small improvements for all of the other cases except for uh, bit vectors, which I will talk about uh, later. And I know why this is. I know that SPCL does not attempt to do this kind of specialization. It requires the client code to declare an element type of the vector. In that case, of course, it's uh, as fast as ours. But if you don't declare any type, then it's very hard to convince the SPCL compiler to do the right thing for the SPCL function. So let me just show you. <coughs> this is the result for a list. And we went up to 10, 10 million elements. And it's EQ for the test function. Here's the result for the vectors. <coughs> Also with EQ, so it, it looks kind of impressive at least uh, like that. So all the other cases, roughly thirty percent uh, faster than SP zero. So a word about bit vectors. Um, the reason we cannot beat the native implementation with bit vectors is of course that um, we have the same inner loop in all of our specialized versions, which is element by element. No same optimizing implementation will process bit vectors element by element. It will do 64 uh, elements at a time or something like that. So there's absolutely no way we can compete with that. But the good news, of course, is that the implementation can introduce a special treatment of bit vectors in the macros, thus preserving the exact implementation of the functions uh, that I showed before. So, future work. Um, we still, I think we still need to, we could still squeeze out some more um, improvements because we haven't been very careful in the exact declarations that the macros provided in each specialization. I think by doing that we can convince um, the, the native compiler to optimize each special version of the loop even more. <clears throat> we need to test our technique on other list, common list implementations. Um, we need to convince the cleaver um, compiler framework uh, to have sufficient uh, optimizations that when we compile it with Cleaver, it will actually optimize the way we, we want it to. Um, it would, so currently our uh, resulting functions are quite big, even though the compiler removed almost all cases for each uh, special version. It would be nice to have that divided in two parts. A very small outer loop, if you want, and then a very large 
cases that are, have this time been generated automatically. That case, uh, in that case, the small outer loop could be inline, and we would have the advantages for small lists, small vectors, short lists, short vectors, uh, because the compiler could then uh, specialize on the call site, which it cannot do now. The, the tests are uh, already uh, are always performed, so it's only uh, really good for long uh, sequences. And some people read the parallel versions of this paper. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. And yes. We have talked about bit vectors, so I think I went outline. My, my question to you is um, uh, correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong because I've seen this for the first time, but um, the end value. And corresponding values need to be valuable at compile time for this to work at all, right? Uh, well, the, in order for the compiler to optimize the loop, the value, it must be known whether it's true or false. Yes. But I mean, a, a compiler could very well do the duplication of the loop if it wanted to. A compiler could say, oh, I know this value is loop invariant, but I don't know what it is. Let me duplicate the loop. But I don't think compilers do that in general. It's kind of complicated to to uh, to, to realize in practice. Mm -hmm. um, good. Um, it's very nice to see that such a uh, such a simple uh, idea that has uh, the results or the, the, the consequences. The consequences like that. Could you go back to the slide where you show the expansion of the of the two branches of the if which are the same? Okay. The next one. So in, in the case where n is true, mm -hmm. why do you still have to have an n? Well, I don't have a choice. I, mean, I, I don't have a choice. The macro expands by duplicating the body. So. Oh, well, maybe it was the next slide then. We showed what this. Yes, in yeah, so this one. When, when n is true, wouldn't the compiler also simplify the until? No. It knows that n is true. In the first branch, in the the first branch n is true. So can it simplify the end? Yeah, yeah, it will simplify the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It will remove the uh, the first branch of the end. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You. Mr. Uh, oh, Mr. Oh. You. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can uh, this technique be uh, done by a uh, compiler in the case where an uh, end is known to be a functional or key argument? Because the compiler most of the time it is a runtime, uh, can be a runtime variant, maybe. Well, yeah, well, so what happens in a typical compiler is that um, it, um, there'll be a function there and it will be set by default. Like if, if you don't give a test or a, or a key, mm -hmm. it will give a default, which is identity or URL or something like that. But since that is, again, a loop invariant, but the compiler doesn't know which value it is. So it's obliged to do something like fun call of a, of a variable, of the contents of a variable. So yeah, again, I mean, a, a really, really smart compiler could duplicate the loop uh, and uh, check if it's a, to do basically what our macros do. But in practice, a compiler writer would not put in that code. So what we do is we just have an if that says, if it's uh, EQ, then EQ. If it's EQL, then EQL, else fun call. Well, I mean, if it's the fun that generates the same code, if the end is declared an optional argument and uh, has a for new value and uh, not for new value. Uh, I'm not sure what you're saying. Yeah, okay. We, let's talk about it that way. It's probably easy. No, you? Is there uh, any way to profile what this approach is doing on the instruction cache? Or <coughs> Um, that's a very good question. Um, I, I, I am going to conjecture that there won't be any impact on the instruction cache. Because what will happen is it's going to do a sequence of preliminary tests. Say, what's the value of the, of the end? What's the value of the test? What's the value of so? And then it's going to start the loop. And that's going to go for the length of the, of the um, sequence. 
So doing that uh, execution of the inner loop, none of the parameters are going to change. So they're going to be predicted perfectly and there's going to be no problem. After a few iterations, the cache is going to be filled up. Um, could you have like a compiler macro or something to generate a uh, generate new bodies like this for the case where it runs into the say constant function form with the key or the key arguments, but not one that just has a type form? Uh, definitely. So he's he's asking could we have a compiler macro to uh, generate cases where we know that um, certain aspects of it are, are constant? Yes, we could. We haven't done that yet. And, that's also part of what I said that we would like for the outermost test thingy to be uh, small, so that it could be inline, and then the compiler macro uh, together with those tests could eliminate almost all cases when it's known in compiler. But we haven't figured that out yet. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. I wonder about the methodology. So I mean. Um, on this slide, we can see the optimized version, um, but um, how do you say? Is that is that something you get directly from the compiler, or it's like an uh, extrapolation from looking at warnings that the compilers? This is from my thinking as a compiler writer. Yeah. That is, if I were the writer of this compiler, okay. I would make the compiler do this optimization. Oh, right. And I am 99.9% .9 sure that that is what's going on in, say, SPCL. Oh, I mean, maybe Crypto can confirm that. All right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.